Good morning and welcome to St. John United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. If you happen to be joining us online through Facebook Live, I'd appreciate leaving a comment and saying good morning to one another so we all know who is there. The October Feast is planned as a drive through event this year, and it will be on Tuesday, October 26th from 5 to 7 p.m. or until the food runs out. It looks like we have most of the food accounted for, but we still need some help with the preparation and the service. So if you can do that, please sign up in the narthex. We are also, again, participating in the Coats for Christmas program with First Presbyterian Church here in Defiance. New and gently used coats will be collected through November 12th. There is a barrel in, this, in the narthex that we're collecting the coats in, and uh, I think Lonnie drops them off every now and again when the barrel gets full. So... Um, if you have any old or gently used or new coats you'd like to, to donate, we would greatly appreciate that. Next Sunday, October 31st, will also be our rite of remembrance. For all those who have died um, in the last year, I'll also have votive candles available on the communion table to light in memory of anyone who may have died that you would like to remember. And lastly, Carolyn, our organist, is um, after 65 years on the bench with no back, has decided that she'd like to sit in another location that has a back. So as such, next Sunday, October 31st, will be her official last day on the organ bench, but she still plans to play occasionally um, for Sundays and, and holidays. So we'll be celebrating Carolyn and, and also welcoming Mark Trinko next Sunday with uh, cake, punch, coffee, and tea after the service. So let us join our hearts and our minds in a spirit of worship as Carolyn plays for us.
I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we uh, center our hearts in worship. Job shouted, and God, in God's time, responded. Job learned the lesson. God's wisdom and power questioned and put to the test. God steps up, seemingly put out to remind Job that he was loved. Just as we are loved. Let us listen to God now as we come in worship. I invite you to join together in singing Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, number one in the hymnals, and we'll be singing verses one and three. Let us join our voices together in calling upon God. Creator God, all living things come from you. Each human being is made in your image, and you love all of it. The majestic presence is seen in the skies above and the earth below. Your gentle presence is found in a colorful butterfly or a buzzing bee. Who are we to doubt you or question how you choose to create and maintain life? Who are we to demand answers to questions we cannot understand? And yet you have compassion on our doubts and invite our questions. You desire to reveal yourself to us in nature, in people, and through your word. You long for us to see you and be aware of your presence. May it be so. You may be seated. Now for our message for the young and the young at heart. A work nearly two years in living with a pandemic, and it's an illness that has impacted everyone in the world, and it's changed a lot of things we do, and shaken really a lot of things that we take for granted. Can you all think of some things, or some new things that we do now that maybe we didn't do before? Wear masks. And what about things that we used to do that have changed and the new way that we will, that will now be normal, the new normal? And I could think of a few. Somebody mentioned masks using hand sanitizers more often, washing our hands more frequently. And what about Zoom meetings and online learning? I mean, all those things were not common before the pandemic, and yet we found some value to them. So in some respects, a lot of those are going to continue after the pandemic. So what good things do you think came out of this experience for you? Any thoughts? Do you have a new appreciation for some of the things that you took for granted before? Well, today we finish our story of Job. And Job has gone through a lot. I mean, he has suffered horribly, but he continues to live out his life. Now, nothing at all is ever going to change the experiences he had. Although we're told at the end of this story today that God restores his life. But there may not be a fully happy ending, but a, a realistic ending, in one, one in which we can learn and we can grow 
and move forward to see whatever it is the future may bring. I mean, we can be restored to wholeness even in the midst of all the suffering and trials that we've experienced. So let's pray. Holy and living God, we are so grateful for your unending love, especially when in the midst of trials and tribulations and struggles, we demand answers and don't seem to find any. We long for your presence, and sometimes we struggle to find you in our hearts. So help us, God, at those moments to see you in others who are reaching out to help us, to console us, and just to sit with us. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Well, it's a time in our worship where we lift any special joys or concerns that we may have in our own lives or the lives of those we love and care for or even just things that are going on in the world that um, we think could use a little prayer. I'll try to summarize each of those prayers and say, Lord, in your mercy, and ask that you respond. Hear our prayer. So are there any special joys or concerns that we can lift up this morning? Martha? For the Lorenz family whose daughter Allison was murdered, Lord, in your mercy. So prayers of our Laurel's cousin's family, George Brown, who they had a memorial service last weekend, Lord, in your mercy. So for John, John's niece, Stephanie, whose husband, 54 years old, passed away from COVID, Lord, in your mercy. And I'll, yes, Janice. So prayers for Ray Richardson, who is having um, some surgery in his knee. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. I'd also like to lift up Becky Simpson. Um, Becky asked for prayers last Sunday. She's going in for a biopsy. It has been confirmed to be early stage cancer, so please hold Becky in your prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And continued prayers for Rebecca, Randy Fruth's daughter, who was undergoing eye surgery, Lord, in your mercy. And then also for um, Marge Castanian's grandson and three children who have COVID, Lord, in your mercy. So let us spend a few moments gathering all these prayers that we have heard and gather them together with those that we still hold within our hearts, knowing God hears and knows our deepest concerns and our greatest joys, even especially when we struggle to bring those to our lips.
creator God. Jesus himself invites us to bring our doubts, our fears, and our questions to you and promises that you will answer them. Hear us now, O God, as we bring them all to you today. Give us patience to wait for your response and humility to accept whatever it is you say. O oh God, so many people come to us sharing doubts about your very existence. Help us to attend to them in a way that reveals your truth. O oh God, so many people and situations in our world threaten to restrict religious freedoms and the right to worship freely in public. How can we use our voices and actions to help people who are truly affected in this way? Oh God, so many people are displaced more than ever before in our history, struggling to find a place of safety, a place they can settle and call home, a place where they can be free and safe. How can we help them, and how can we use our gifts and our talents to help them? Oh God, so many people are facing injustices often caused by others or perpetuated by unjust structures making lives miserable and unbearable. How can we find ways to ensure they receive just treatment and answers? And oh God, so many people in our world blame you for all that is wrong, for all that happens to cause pain and suffering. How can we find ways to help people understand that we have no answers for why things happen, but we believe you are not to blame? Oh God, so many people today take your name in vain and use your name to claim victory over others or to make people behave how they think they should while claiming it is freedom of religion. How can we help people who have been hurt and damaged by this kind of abuse of your name? Oh God, so many people long to know you better. How can we be the church and help people come to know you and love you as we do? Help us to see you and help us to see ourselves in a new way, just as Job did as we pray in the way that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Well, the Church of the Work continues and some may say even grows in this time of the pandemic. So if you happen to be watching us or joining us, um, participating on Facebook Live, I'd like you to take a few moments to Fill out an envelope to send in your gift or sign in to our Tithely account online. And for those of you in the sanctuary, because of the pandemic, we're still not passing plates yet, but the plates are located at the center entrance to the sanctuary where you can leave your offering either as you come in or as you go. Seeing the bounty that God has made for our good use, let us now give our tithes and our offerings for the work of the church in the care of of the world and of the poor.
let us join our voices together in the dedication of these gifts. Eternal and everlasting one, we are glad to be united in your presence, to offer our gifts and our worship to you. Take and receive all that we have, give it freely, and invite you to take and use all we offer to build your kingdom here and now. So be it. Amen. You may be seated as we sing together. My hope is built on nothing less, number 403, in your hymnals, verses 1 and 4. Will you join me in prayer? Dear God, let us not only hear of you, but see you with our own eyes through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture for this morning is taken from Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 6 and 10 through 17. And I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. Job answered the Lord, I know you can do anything. No plan of yours can be opposed successfully. You said, Who is this darkening counsel without knowledge? I have indeed spoken about things I didn't understand, wonders beyond my comprehension. You said, Listen, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will inform me. My ears had heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I relent and find comfort on dust and ashes. Then the Lord changed Job's fortune when he prayed for his friends, and the Lord doubled all Job's earlier possessions. All his brothers, sisters, and acquaintances came to him and ate food with him in his house. They were comforted and consoled him, concerning all the disaster the Lord had brought on him, and each one gave him a cassata and a gold ring. Then the Lord blessed Job's latter days more than his former ones. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named one Jemima, a second Kezia, and the third, Karen Hapuk. No women in all the land were as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave an inheritance to them along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw four generations of his children. Then Job died old and satisfied. The Holy Spirit breathes into us these words. <clears throat> My wife Laurel inherited two paintings of her great grandparents, which were painted by her great grandmother's sister. And she, had, she got the uh, portrait of her great grandfather several years ago from her mother, who had it hanging in her living room. 
And after her mom died, Laurel contacted her cousin to see if she wanted to reunite the painting of her great-grandfather with the painting her cousin had of her great-grandmother. And since none of her children wanted either painting, her cousin told her she would ship great-grandma's painting to Laurel so she could reunite them. They're currently hanging together in our dining room. Well, when Laurel's cousin sent us the painting, we found it a little worse for wear after having been in storage for a number of years. There was a hole in one corner of the canvas, not to mention that the frame was damaged and a little paint had flaked off in a few areas and there was much need of cleaning. And on top of that, the frame it was in didn't match the one her great-grandfather was in. So Laurel took the painting and had it sent out for restoration and reframing. And the hole and the missing paint were repaired with the new paint, paint blended in. And the whole thing was cleaned and then reframed, but in a way that left a nice patina of age. It wasn't perfect. And I think if you knew what you were looking for, you could probably find the area that was repaired. But it was in beautiful and is in beautiful condition with restoration. Well, we complete our journey with Job today. And on the surface, it appears that everything is wrapped up quite nicely with Job eventually getting back even more than he originally had. But as the New Interpreter's Bible discusses, there are a lot of ambiguities in the divine speech leading up to today's text. And then in Job's reply, which we heard today, like elsewhere in Job, the the Hebrew is a little unclear and can be interpreted in several different ways, which may in fact have been the author's intent. And as such, there may actually be more than one legitimate interpretation of this passage of Scripture. But when I lived in Germany, I realized how much spoken American English uses tonal inflection to help get across the meaning of a statement. I also realized how often we Americans use sarcasm. But maybe that's a Midwestern thing, or maybe that's just me. I don't really know. But sarcasm can only be understood if you perceive the tonal inflection in how the words are being used. If a non-native English speaker is listening to a conversation, they may not catch on to what is meant when something is said sarcastically. Because in sarcasm, one often says the opposite of what one means. And if you don't understand the tonal inflection, you'll completely misunderstand the statement. That's also one of the reasons it's, it's so difficult to express sarcasm in the written word. I've seen so many people, myself included, get into trouble with a Facebook post or a tweet because there's no such font for sarcasm. Now, there are some interpreters who think that Job's reply may be, in a sense, sarcastic, calling out God for the way Job was treated. Now, others just take it at face value as if Job, while not capitulating to his friends by admitting that he sinned and deserve what befell him, expresses true repentance for what he thought of God because of what happened to him. In other words, they believe Job begins to understand that not everything that happens in the world is a direct result of God's actions or because of his own actions. He begins to understand the natural chaos in life. And thus Job repents, indicating that he accepts God's judgment that Job spoke without knowledge and understanding. Job perceives then how his preconceived notions of God and his friend's understanding of the prevailing wisdom of the nature of God, do good, get blessed, do bad, get cursed, hindered his own ability to understand everything that had happened to him and why. Now, when I counsel someone who has experienced a a traumatic event of some sort, especially one where grief is involved, I always try to help them understand that there's no getting over what happened. There's only getting through it. All that we experience forms and shapes us in one way or another. 
Now, how that happens may be different for each one of us. But the reality is we carry with us the experience that we had, and we carry it forever. There's no going back. There's no getting over it. There's no leaving it behind. There's only moving forward. So yes, we go on with life, not getting past what happened, but going with it, with restoration. Now, with all that happened to Job and his wife, with all that they endured, even if they found that life in their latter days was fuller than their former days, as the text reads, they were no longer the same people as before. There was no replacement of what was lost. I mean, Job's, restora- Job's restoration was, was not like finding a replacement for a broken piece of porcelain that's broken. It was and is more like, I guess, the Japanese art of kintsugi in which a, a broken piece of pottery is repaired with gold-filled lacquer where the pieces are joined so that the flaw is seen as a unique piece or unique part of the piece's history. The pain's still there, but the piece is held together in love with restoration. Now, many I have spoken to, especially clergy, have been struggling during this time of the pandemic. The church, and I'm using a big C here, has been struggling for relevancy for many years now. By some accounts, somewhere between 3,500 to 4,000 churches closed their doors every year. When the UCC was formed in 1957, for example, it had over 2 million members and nearly 7,000 churches. And according to the 2020 statistical profile that the UCC published based on a survey that was taken prior to the pandemic, membership in the UCC was a little over 800,000 people with just under 4,900 churches. And I have to say there's a feeling that whatever shift that's going on in our society that's impacting churches has probably been accelerated with the pandemic. But I also believe that the alliance between the evangelical church and politics has only added fuel to that fire. What Job discovered is that perhaps not everything has a reason. As Carol A. Newsom writes in the New Interpreter's Bible, now given what has been disclosed to Job in the divine speeches, Job is able to perceive a world in which the vulnerability of human existence can be understood not in terms of divine enmity, but in terms of a creation within which the chaotic is restrained, but never fully eliminated. In Job's reply, he shows that he has a new sense of perceiving God. He knows that what he heard of God prior to that was incorrect. And so now Job sees God in a new way. There's also a lot of ambiguity in Job's final sentence. The Common English Bible interpreted it as, Therefore I relent and find comfort on dust and ashes. And in this interpretation, Job gives up trying to find a reason for it all and simply surrenders himself to what is, to life, to dust and ashes. The Common English Bible also has a footnote that the sentence could also be interpreted as, therefore I despise and repent of dust and ashes, or even therefore I despise concerning dust and ashes. That seems to mean that perhaps he's admitting that he was wrong, hating his anger and his grief against God. There's even stronger language in the New Revised Standard Version, in the New International Version of the Bible, with their interpretation reading, Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. As if Job is still afraid of of God and feels the need to humble himself to avoid punishment. Regardless, it's apparent, no matter which interpretation you read or how you read it, it's apparent that Job knows how much he's endured. 
There's no getting over it, only through it. And there's no going back, only forward. Newsom writes, As Job discovered, events do occur that challenge and sometimes overturn the paradigms that have shaped one's perceptions. She says, Yet people do not readily let go of the frameworks that have shaped their vision of reality. Often it is when we have already begun to suspect that something is wrong with our paradigms that we become most resistant to allowing them to be challenged. She says it, it is not just that we cannot see something, but that we are afraid of looking squarely at what we can glimpse just past the periphery of our vision. Liminality, uncertainty scares us. Job gave up trying to find a justification for his dilemma. He finally saw the framework with which he and his friends viewed God and the world, and he was shaken with new vision. Now the story of Job ends just as it began. Wonderful poetry of Job's discussions and arguments with his friends, with God, and with himself bookended at the beginning and the end by prose telling the story of Job, almost like a narrator opening and closing the story. But I find something dissonant with the way that the story ends. It's almost as if it were a, a typical Hollywood movie released during dark times in which the hero always wins in the end. It seems to ignore all the action that occurred between the beginning and the end. And we're told that Job's life was more than restored and renewed relationships with his family and friends who comforted and consoled him, gave him food and money and gifts, while the Lord blessed Job with twice as much wealth as he had previously, and then equaling the number of children he and his wife had before. Now, curiously, his three daughters in the closing passage are mentioned by name and claim to be the most beautiful in all the land, and then included in his inheritance something which is not at all fitting with the time. And I'm not sure what to make of that. But if this ending is to reflect real life, it's not completely a bed of roses for Job. Yes, Job and his wife found a life with restoration, but even with the abundance they now had, it was not the life they had before. These children they had were not the children that they lost. And still, perhaps, it's a story of Job's trust in God, trust that carried him through pain and back into life. I mean, had Job held on to the past, had he held on to his grief and his anger and his pain, he would not have been able to enter the future that awaited him. Now, in a way, what we experience with Job in the poetry bookended by the prose, I kind of see it as a, a liminal space, a time between. The future ended up unfolding with restoration, but not without the reality of the past experience. I truly believe we in the church are in just such a liminal space made even more real and uncertain in this pandemic. We cannot hang on to the past or wish that what we thought we had will return. Right now we need to sit and listen and to attend to what this time may be revealing to us, just as the liminal time Job experienced revealed a new vision to him. We need to sit and listen and attend to what this time may be revealing to us. My friends, restoration is a part of God's ultimate plan. And sometimes the chaos of life thrusts us into a liminal time in which nothing seems certain. 
The very ground we stand upon seems shaky. And such a time is a time for us to attend to what the Spirit may be trying to reveal. I believe there is a pivotal role for us to play in the restoration. Like Job and his family, wholeness and justice are possible in this world, but only if we embrace the brokenness within us. Let go of the assumptions we have had, the current understanding of who and how we are in the world and what it means to be the church in the world, and trust in the grace of God for a future that may look far different from our past. We need to yield to the purposes of God for what may come with restoration. Acknowledging the past for sure, but being open to the future. May you relent and find comfort on dust and ashes. May you be comforted and consoled with the presence of God. May you let the memories of the past fill you with love as you embrace the future and let God's Spirit continue to work in you and in the world with restoration. Amen. And now I invite you to join together with me in praying together in the time of a pandemic. As the number of cases continues to fall in our area, may we be mindful of those who may still be at risk, whether vaccinated or not. May we be compassionate toward those who have a need to continue to take precautions for reasons unknown to us. May we who live in countries with more resources have compassion and share in our abundance when we see those in countries who are struggling. May we who can take vaccinations and eat at restaurants respect those whose lives depend on their jobs in the service industry. May we who are worried about our investments remember those who live paycheck to paycheck. May we who have the freedom to venture from our homes remember those who have no home. As fear and misinformation grip our country, let us choose love and truth as we return to being able to physically embrace one another. Let us be compassionate enough to simply let our presence be the living embrace of God for those for whom physical contact may be uncomfortable and help all of creation flourish. Amen. I invite you to join together in singing our final hymn, If You But Trust in God, to guide you, number 410, and we'll be singing verses 1 and 3.
one who created the, <clears throat> excuse me, the one who created the heavens and the earth, whose understanding knows no limits. The one who invites honest questions, inquiring minds, and open hearts, bless you in the ongoing adventure of life and faith, now and forever. Our worship has ended. Our service.